recordings. Sergeant Bradley, you can start now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. Will all council members and council staff please turn on their videos at this time? Please place all cell phones and electronic devices on vibrate. Any testimonies can be sent to land use testimonies at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's land use testimonies at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, and we will be blah, we will begin momentarily. We're ready. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Adrienne Adams and welcome to this historic meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. This is the first ever remote meeting of this subcommittee. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Traeger, Aaron, Miller, Rosenthal, Chair Salamanca, and Council Member Kalos. Today, we will conduct three public hearings on three HPD applications. 659, the 311 through 313 Pleasant Avenue Cluster, LUC, the Union Avenue Cluster, and LU661, and considered application both related to the 266 West 96th Street project. Before we begin, however, I recognize the committee council who will go over the remote hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Adams. I am Jeffrey Campagna, counsel to the subcommittee. I will be making a number, number of announcements throughout the hearing to facilitate remote operations. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not pre registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. You may also email your testimony in lieu of live testimony to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Only register if you intend to testify on one of today's agenda items. If you're a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. I will be announcing applicants and members of the public who wish to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. Applicant panels and members of the public will be on mute until they are recognized by the chair to testify. The chair will recognize each applicant panel as a group. The chair will recognize members of the public one at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your mic will be unmuted. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Each member of the public will have two minutes to testify. If you have additional testimony you would like to submit to the, the subcommittee to consider, you can email to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions of applicants or members of the public should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands and recognize members to speak. At the end of public testimony on each item, I will call for the meeting to stand at ease while we check to see if there are any more members of the public who wish to testify. All hearings will be kept open until the end of today's meeting, at which time I will check to see if there's anyone left to testify on today's items. Lastly, as we adjust to hosting public hearings via webinar, there may be extended pauses as we encounter technical delays. We'll now continue with today's agenda. Thank you, Council. I will repeat these directions from time to time as necessary. I now open the public hearing on our first item, LU 659, the 311 through 313 Pleasant Avenue cluster. This application was submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. 
requesting the waiver of the designation requirements and approval of an urban development action area project and requesting an exemption from real property taxes for property located in Manhattan at 311 through 313 Pleasant Avenue, 51 through 55 East 129th Street and 1263 Park Avenue. The properties are located in council districts represented by council members Kalos, Ayala, and Perkins. I re now recognize council member Kalos for opening remarks. Thank you so very much, uh, Chair Adams, for your amazing uh, work. Uh, and uh, I'm council member Ben Kalos. As always, you can uh, catch me and engage in a conversation about this at uh, Ben Kalos on social media. Today, I lend my support to 311-313 Pleasant Avenue cluster. Uh, one of the buildings, 1263 Park Avenue, sits in my district. 1263 Park Avenue went through foreclosure in 1978 and entered the TIL program in 1998. Since this time, this building and its residents have complied with the requirements of the tenant's interim lease program. The building now needs substantial rehabilitation. The proposed affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program will ensure this rehab happens while preserving the much needed affordable housing for these residents. Under substantial rehabilitation, the construction worker will consist of structural joist replacement, electrical upgrades, and replacement of building systems, including new windows, new roofs, plumbing upgrades, and installation of new boilers. The scope of work also includes new bathrooms, kitchens, entry doors, mason work, new flooring, new mailboxes, and hallway upgrades with bi-level lighting, painting, and asbestos, and lead removal. I know they're particularly interested in getting rid of the environmental hazards. Uh, at construction loan closing, the building will be uh, conveyed to Restoring Communities HDFC while the property and tenant management responsibilities will be transferred to the designated developer, Banana Kelly CIA Incorporated. Following construction completion, Restoring Communities HDFC will convey the property to the Cooperative Housing Development Fund Corporation, HDFC, formed by the new building's tenants. We are not streaming, so the meeting will stand at ease while we fix the streaming. I apologize. As we said, this is our first time doing this. Do no we... worries. Uh, do I, are we starting over from the very beginning or from the middle? Um, I'm checking right now. Okay. While we are standing at ease for any members of the public who wish to testify, please go to the council website to register for this hearing if you have not already done so.
Did we lose council member Kalos? Are we uh, back on? I'm checking. Okay, my staff has let me know that they are able to see the stream on Vimeo. Okay, then you may continue. Thank you very much. The existing tenants will become shareholders and will pay $2,500 per apartment with a monthly maintenance at 41% of AMI. That equates to $1,006 per month for a two bedroom unit. 1263 Park Avenue currently has 10 units, eight of which are occupied. The two vacant units will be sold for a price of affordable to families at 165% of AMI. I have engaged with the existing tenants at this location. They inform me of their excitement and desire to participate in this program. I look forward to a smooth process and are anxious for it to be completed. I'd like to thank the members of 1263 Park Avenue Tenants Association. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, and, and their president, Ronald Stewart. Uh, for engaging this project and for communicating with my office. And I'd also like to thank the staff at HPD who worked on this project for helping to preserve and create affordable housing in my district. I also wanna thank the committee staff for getting this done through the pandemic and making sure that we provide affordability for generations. So thank you, I support these projects and uh, we're trying to do multiple hearings at once. So I'll actually be jumping off and going to the next item, but I wanna thank you and thank the chair and urge all the committees uh, members to support this project. Thank you. The meeting stands at ease again.
So we are working to make sure that the live stream is up for the public. That's why we're standing at ease is a technical issue. Council members, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, our technical issues are resolved. We are streaming, so we can proceed. Thank you very much, Council Member Kalos, for your remarks, and thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate that. Okay, we're going to go ahead and proceed. Council, please call the first panel for LU 659. The applicant panel for LU 659 is Christine O'Connell and Sarah Mallory, both from HPD. Great. Okay, Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hi, my name is Sarah Mallory and I am here on behalf of HPD. I'm Christine O'Connell, I'm here on behalf of HPD. Thank you very much, you may begin. Thank you so much. Land use item number 659 consists of the proposed disposition of three partially occupied city owned buildings and the approval of an article 11 tax benefit for the buildings located at 311 Pleasant Avenue, block 1710, lot 27, 5155 East 129th Street, block 1754, lot 25, and 1263 Park Avenue, block 1625, lot 72, 
in Manhattan Council Districts 5, 8, and 9. Known as the 311-313 Pleasant Avenue ANCP cluster, the buildings will be developed through HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. Under the program guidelines, city-owned multiple dwellings are conveyed to Restoring Communities HGFC for $1 per tax lot and then rehabilitated by private developers selected through a competitive process. The developer will sign a site development and management agreement with Restoring Communities that will be in effect until a co-op conversion occurs and the title transfers from Restoring Communities HGFC to the individual cooperatives. From the time of the cooperative conversion, the developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-ops will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hire a new company approved by HPD. All of the buildings entered into city ownership through an in-rim foreclosure process. 311-313 Pleasant Avenue and 1263 Park Avenue became city owned in 1978 and entered the tenant interim lease program in 1998 while 5155 East 129th Street became city owned in 1978 and entered the till program in 2001. As part of the till program, Tenants are required to form tenant associations to self-manage their buildings, which includes collecting rents under a net lease agreement with HPD. Currently, there are 38 occupancies and these tenants are ready to move forward with the next steps in cooperative conversion under HPD's ANCP. The designated developer for the Pleasant Avenue cluster is Banana Kelly, an organization that was selected through a competitive process. The developer will be responsible for managing the temporary relocation of tenants and rehabilitation activities. The work will consist of structural joist replacement work, electrical upgrades, and replacement of building systems, including new windows, a new roof, plumbing upgrades, and the installation of a new boiler. Apartments in some of the buildings will require layout changes to ensure that layouts conform with the 2014 DOB building code and are handicap accessible. Post rehab, the Pleasant Avenue cluster will have a total of 64 residential units of various mixture types. Post rehabilitation, the mixture of unit types will be one studio, 12 one bedroom, 22 two bedroom, 13 three bedroom, and 16 four bedroom apartments. Of the 64 units, 38 units will be occupied by returning shareholders. Household incomes for existing tenants range between 100% to 110% of AMI and the cooperative interests attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants for $2,500. Additionally, maintenance is anticipated to be approximately 41% AMI for existing tenants, which is roughly $769 for a studio, $826 for a one bedroom, $1,006 for a two bedroom, $1,157 for a three bedroom, and $1,297 for a four bedroom apartment. The cooperative interest attributable to vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 165% of the area median income. In addition to seeking disposition approval, land use item number 659 requests a 40 year article 11 tax exemption in order to help the shareholders maintain affordability. The term of the tax exemption will be coterminous with the regulatory agreement and the total tax benefit is approximately $12,415,000 149, with a net present value of $3,468,436,000. In order to facilitate development of the 311-313 Pleasant Avenue ANCB cluster, HPD seeks approval of land use item 659. Thank you. Thank you. I would like my colleagues to ask questions. If you have questions for the panel, please click on the raise hand button on the participant panel. Council, are there any council member questions at this time? I am checking now, Chair. Council member Kalos has a question. Council member Kalos. Thank you, uh, less so a question, more just a, uh, a thank you. The uh, testimony was incredibly informative. It included the net present value. And I feel that uh, the members of the public uh, are well informed and I appreciate the continued leadership of the chair. I guess my, my only question, uh, the only one is if I'm watching at home uh, and I understand that there's at least two units available at 165% of AMI, what is that income threshold? 
What if I make less and where do I apply? Sure, hi, I'm Christine uh, O'Connell. I'm the director of the program. Um, we, the, the agency has sort of a limitation of uh, an area median income of 165. To be a little bit more specific, the units are gonna be sold at 100% AMI. So they will be even more affordable than, than our limitation, which is great. Um, the, the minimum income for a purchaser is 100% of area median income. And I'm just looking to see what that is for this year. Um, let's see. That's about, for a household size of two, it's an income limit of about $85,000 a year. Um, in order to purchase one of these units that will become available once the renovation's complete, um, an applicant can open up a newspaper, they can go to the HPD website. Um, we will market and advertise these units through Housing Connect. Um, and so they, at the time that this will be um, available, the applicant can actually fill out an application online. Um, and, and the process will go from there. It is a, a lottery. Okay. I'm going to assume that answered Council Member Kalos's question. Yes? Okay. Thank you so much. Council, are there any other Council Member questions? There are council member questions from Chair Salamanca, Council Member Miller, and Council Member Barron in that order. Okay, Chair Salamanca. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I wanna just start by uh, saying that uh, Banana Kelly, uh, they were basically born out of my district and they've been in the establishment for, I would say over 30 years. They're a very reputable not-for-profit who provides housing opportunities for uh, communities of color, and um, you know, um, and so I'm I'm excited. Um, ben, you're gonna you're gonna have uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Kalos, you're gonna have a uh, you're gonna have a great organization working in your uh, in your district. Um, I, there's a similar project that's going a similar application that's going to be heard next. Uh, which is in my district and is very similar to uh, this application. And my question, and I know that Councilmember Cato spoke about the marketing. He asked about that. Um, my question here is, what's the AMI again that they're going to be offering here? Is it, I, I heard 100% AMI? Yes. So the units will be sold at 100% of area median income and we'll market between a band of 100 and 110% AMI. So we can get sort of a pool of applicants uh, to purchase into this, these co-ops. Why? But this this application is also in Councilmember Ayala's uh, district, correct? Yes. Why? Why is the AMI so high? Why we're not, you know, low, um, giving other opportunities for individuals with a lower AMI? So and why? And because in my district, when we look at my application, I, I don't. I, I think they're it's lower than one hundred percent. It is lower. Yes. So why, why, why are you doing, why are you allowing a lower AMI in my district, but you're not allowing that uh, uh, opportunity in other districts? So the way that we set sale prices in our program is based on looking at the market and determining also the individual needs of a project. Every project has a different set of costs based on the level of work, the number of units, the number of occupied versus vacant. Um, and with those different factors, we are setting sale prices. In this particular community, we identified that the, we, we generally look at the cost to rent versus the cost to buy, and, and we're trying to determine if someone who is not currently a homeowner, because this is for home, first-time homebuyers only, somebody who may be currently living in the neighborhood is an applicant. With those two factors, we're looking at if we can, we're looking to set sale prices so that an applicant can afford, but also would be interested in leaving the renter's market and becoming a homeowner. All right. What's what's the total cost to renovate this building? Uh, this right. building? So the cluster cost for this particular project is about twenty eight million dollars. Um, the city of New York puts in uh, a little over two hundred thousand dollars a unit uh, for the renovation cost. That's our program standard for our term sheet. Um, and the remainder of the costs um, are being paid for by grants and also a private a private loan. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chad. 
Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Um, I'm gonna ask right now that all council members turn their cameras on. Council members, thank you very much. All right, I recognize uh, council member Barron. It's council member Miller is oh. next. Oh, okay, it, we're going in order. We'll come back to council member Barron, council member Miller. Um, wherever you go is, is fine. If you, if you have me up, that is it. I trust that my I, a learned colleague will be uh, asking similar questions. Um, there's no, very little to, to ask, but uh, so I do have a, a couple of questions about the, um, uh, the, the chair asked uh, about the contributions of the city towards the innovations. And my questions are what percentage of the total cost uh, of the renovations uh, will the city be picking up at the rate of 200,000 per unit, as well as um, what is the the, uh, the start to finish date on, on this uh, very significant work that is being done, almost a total renovation of, of these residents. And, and then certainly um, as relates to AMIs, um and 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 the communities uh, that are represented is there a community board uh, uh preference is there a community preference and what community boards are are being represented um in these preferences sure thank you for those questions um so i just did a quick tally we're covering about 48 percent of the total renovation costs of the project hpd is <clears throat> putting in about 48 percent um on top of that, as I mentioned, there's grants. So there's state grants the, through the Affordable Housing Corporation. Um, they're contributing another approximately 10, eight to 10 percent of the total renovation costs. So we are we are definitely um, putting in the investment to keep the affordability there. Um, as we mentioned, just to go back, that insiders are paying $2,500 for the purchase of their unit, um, which is much lower than the vacant unit sale price. In terms of timing. Um, our projects usually, when we close on construction financing to the time that we convert to a co-op is approximately two to two and a half years. Um, so the sooner we get this to a closing, the better. These folks have been waiting a very long time. Um, and the last question that you asked was related to marketing um, and specifically community preference. So the agency um, has actually has a policy that if a building is already occupied, which these buildings are are occupied, um, a little a little bit over fifty percent occupied, we actually are not able to utilize a community preference. Um, we do have set asides for um, uh, mobility and um, audiovisual uh, impairment, but we don't have um, set asides for community preference. That being said, and, and this is a question that comes up all the time. Um, what we do is there's always a local, um, a local newspaper or a local um, periodical that the advertisement goes into. There's also a, um, a, an info session and we do those info sessions within the neighborhood that the property is currently is being advertised. Um, so we do hope that by partnering with, with council members, by advertising in a local periodical and also having those on-site um, marketing or info sessions that we can we can generate some interest from the local community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we go to Councilmember Barron, I believe has an announcement. For anybody who is an attendee, a member of the public who would like to testify on any of the items today, if you did not specifically register on the council website before entering this webinar, please go to the council website now and register so that our intake people can make sure that you are in the right applicant uh, group for testifying. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, council. Okay, council member Barron. Thank you. Am I, I think I'm, Am I live? Can you hear me? We hear you. We hear okay, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I just have one question. The apartments are presently, um, half of them are occupied? Yes, 38 out of the 64 are occupied. 
And these 38 persons, will they have, do they intend to become co-op owners? Do you have any idea? Yes. So the, the residents who live in these buildings are already in the tenant interim lease or till program. They oh. had to comply with ongoing participation requirements okay. in order to have this opportunity. And the price for them will be $2,500 per unit? That's or correct. does it depend on the size of the unit? So some yeah. of the, it's per unit, whatever the size of the unit is. Absolutely. So someone who's going to have, I think, a four bedroom will pay two thousand five hundred, and someone who will have a one bedroom will also pay two thousand five hundred. That's correct. That seems to be a, a bit of inequity there. Is it's that a, yeah. So it's a it's a program standard, um, and and just to give a little historical context, so Till always had a purchase price of two hundred and fifty dollars, right. regardless of the unit size. Um, and in 2012, we changed to, um, to 2,500 to sort of, uh, you know, sort of bring the program up to speed, bring it up to sort of contemporary times. Um, but since 2012, when we did raise the price to 2,500, we have instituted something called the Unit Purchase Savings Plan, which for residents that earn 80% AMI or below, um, their rent paid during construction, a portion of it would go towards that purchase price and, and they're out of pocket when they convert to co-op would just be 250. So as long as they pay their rent um, at the end, they would just, they would kick in the last 250. So well, since there are only uh, half of the units are now occupied, if a person lives in a one bedroom and wants to get a four bedroom, is that something that they would be eligible to do? Because if I have one bedroom and I see that there's an opportunity to have a larger unit for my mm -hmm. family or whatever, mm -hmm. then would I be able to uh, pay that two thousand five hundred and get a larger unit? No. So we actually we we make sure that the residents they receive the same unit that they had prior to renovation. Um, we make sure that they have the same square footage, that they are returned to the same unit. We do make allowances if a resident has a mobility issue or um, some type of medical issue where they would prefer to move to a lower floor. We would honor that request with, through documentation, um, but we ensure that they get the same size unit that they had uh, if it was on an upper floor and it was a two bedroom coming downstairs to a two bedroom. That seems to be uh, unfair that a person who's lived there will not have an opportunity to upgrade since they're paying the same amount regardless of the size of the unit. It seems like there should be some consideration for them uh, to be able to get a larger unit since they're paying the same price as a person who has a larger unit. I would just like to add though that um, the unit purchases, so the vacant unit sales are coming in to pay for the renovation of the building. And so, you know, if we're talking about reserving, say there's a number of large families in the building and they all want four bedrooms. If we're talking about reserving vacant apartments that are four bedrooms, we're losing out on those sale prices that's helping to pay for the renovation. Um, the building would overall have more debt. And this conversation does come up with the residents a lot. And, and we explain it in this way that it's really important that we have the sale prices coming in for those vacant apartments, particularly if they're larger apartments, because it keeps the debt on the building lower, which in turn keeps the maintenance lower. Um, so it, it all it's all interconnected um, related to that. Well, I, I want to talk to my colleagues about seeing how we can change that, that regulation or that limitation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Councilmember Barron. Council, are there any more council member questions? Council members, if you have any additional questions, please press the raise hand button now. Chair Adams, there are no more council member questions. Thank you. There being no more questions for this panel, the panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, council member Kalos. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on LU 659, the Pleasant Avenue cluster? Yes, there is one member of the public registered to testify on LU 659, Brian Saad.
Okay. Um, members of the public will be given two minutes to speak. Please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Time starts now. Do we have Mr. Saad? Yeah, uh, hi, hello. I, I don't, I don't have any questions. All of my, all of the information has been presented. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Council, are there any other members wishing to testify on LU 659, the 311 through 313 Pleasant Avenue cluster? If there are any other members of the public who are here to testify on LU 659, please use the raise hand function now. There are no other members of the public wishing to testify on LU 659. Thank you. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 659 at this time, we will now move on to our next hearing. I now open the public hearing on our next item, LU 660, the 993 through 995 Union Avenue cluster. This is an application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development requesting the waiver of the designation requirements and approval of an urban development area action plan. Uh, action area project and requesting an exemption from real property taxes to facilitate the preservation of four buildings and 69 units of affordable home ownership. The properties are located at 774, 993, and 995 Union Avenue and 1042 Longfellow Avenue in Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. And I now recognize Chair Salamanca for opening remarks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Adams. Um, I uh, look forward to hearing uh, a testimony today on LU's uh, 660, the Union Avenue cluster in my district in the Bronx. Uh, but first I would like to acknowledge as Chair Adams did earlier that today is the first remote subcommittee hearing on land use applications. Um, I would like to thank everyone who worked to make today's historic subcommittee hearing a reality. Um, I know I speak for many uh, when I say we are eager to get back to work, especially because through the work of this subcommittee, we facilitate the construction of, mu of much needed uh, affordable housing. Um, and with this application that's being uh, presented today in my district, uh, I'm excited about it. Um, but my concerns are the marketing of these units and how do we, because there is no community preference, how do we ensure that residents in our communities are actually taking advantage of these opportunities and we're not getting outsiders coming in and taking advantage of these opportunities. So I look forward to hearing from the applicant uh, and, and hopefully they can answer those questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you and well said, Chair Salamanca. Thank you so much. Council, please call the first panel. The applicant panel for LU 660, the 993 through 995 Union Avenue cluster is Christine O'Connell and Sarah Mallory on behalf of HPD and Samantha Magistro who will present for Bronx Pro. All right, you are both still under oath. We have to uh, swear in the third panelist. I'm okay. unmuted. Please administer the affirmation. Samantha Magistro, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your presentation is now being loaded into Zoom. When you request the next slide, a staff member will advance it. As always, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Samantha Magistro. I'm a principal of the developer um, Bronx Pro. And I'm here to present um, our project at Longfellow Union. Slide. 
Um, we're really here um, and excited to be here today to present this project. I also want to thank uh, council and staff for continue to for making um, this hearing virtual and supporting affordable housing work in these uncertain times. Um, as a small business Bronx based organization, um, that kind of support is really important. Slide. Um, this project is, be is being developed by uh, two organizations, Avante and Bronx Pro. Both are experienced affordable housing developers. We have specific experience in gut renovation of city owned properties for the purpose of affordable housing development. Slide. As mentioned before, these are the uh, four properties that will be undergoing a gut renovation for the purpose of, a low ex of affordable housing. Slide. Here's a map of their location in the Bronx. Slide. Um, the project is anticipated to cost $33 million. Um, it will be financed by substantially by HPD Capital, also a loan from CPC, AHC grants, um, and a small bit of developer equity. Slide. Currently, um, the project has um, 69 units. Uh, there are 31 existing residents. Uh, the balance of those units, 38, will be sold to outsiders. Existing residents, as discussed in the last project, will be sold the properties for the units for $2,500. The maintenance will be structured between 40 and 50% of AMI. Vacant uh, unit sales prices are will be at 75% of AMI. So you'll see um, the cost for a two bedroom in the Union Avenue building is about 180,000. The marketing bound here will be for individuals who earn between 75 and 90% of AMI. Slide. Uh, this is affordability continued. Um, you, I just wanted to note on this slide, the maintenance, which will be set at 40% of AMI for the Union properties and 50% of AMI for the um, Longfellow building. Slide. The scope of work for this project is gut re rehabilitation. So there'll be all brand new systems, all new kitchens and bathrooms and mechanical systems. Um, we'll also make sure that the building is very green to keep operating costs low for both the, you know, the owners as well as the um, overall co-ops. Um, we're also taking this opportunity to approve accessibility to the buildings and work with the residents. Um, current, I think that's the last slide. Um, the only thing that I will know is that we've current, we've been working with the residents. Um, we've relocated about 50% of them outside of their portfolio. So we're very eager to move forward with this project um, and we're excited to do so. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I completely agree with Chair Salamanca. This looks like a very exciting uh, project. And, um, uh, it, it, you know, if we could do more work like this, um, you know, all, all things considered, and especially considering the AMI factor, I think that we will be doing our constituents across the city a great service by doing this. So thank you very much. Um, I now invite my colleagues to ask any questions. Council, are there any council member questions at this time? We have questions from Chair Salamanca and then Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you, Salamanca. Yes, thank you, Chair Adams. Um, and thank you for that presentation. I am really excited about this project. And, um, and Bronx Pro has done a good job in communicating with me, uh, ensuring that, um, you know, a lot of my answers, my questions have been answered. But um, so because I want to compare this project with the previous project, what's the total? How much is the city putting in for this project? So um, let me just open it up. Um, so the underwriting isn't finalized, but the um, currently we're putting uh, HPD is putting close to sixty percent of the um, sources in for the for the project. What's the dollar amount? Um, Christine, you can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's but I have nineteen million in my pro forma that I'm looking at. Nineteen million. So you know, and going back to you know what I mentioned, why, why are my AMIs lower than the previous project? 
So for this particular project, Samantha, jump in if I'm, if I'm misspeaking, but on this particular project, when we evaluated rents and we evaluated the market, the sales market, what we saw is that it's, it's a little bit lower than in East Harlem. And so we, we've sized the sale prices to reflect that. We wanna make sure that when we go to market these units that we are marketing them and, and we can actually get buyers lined up. We've had instances, unfortunately, in the program where we've had to recalibrate sale prices, which has uh, caused a lag or delay in conversion. Um, so the sale prices in this particular cluster are set at 75% AMI, uh, which reflects you know, not just the rental, but the sales market so that we, we feel that these will be attractive to, to prospective buyers within the area. Um, so uh, let's say that uh, we approve uh, these applications at this committee, it goes through land use and then it goes through council. When will, how does this work? When, when will HPD close on these projects? So um, we have submitted applications to the Man Office of Management and Budget, OMB, uh, for the HPD funds that will help these projects move forward. Um, a lot of the pre-development work has already been done, as Samantha mentioned. Uh, almost half of the portfolio has already been uh, relocated out. Um, because these are substantial rehabs, they do require relocation. Um, we are hoping that with this approval and a couple of other approvals from the Department of Buildings and OMB that we could close by July or August, knowing that, you know, there's some uncertainty right now with approvals from the city and in, in, different, in different venues, but we are looking for July, August. So, you know, and the reason I ask this question is because there's a lot of affordable housing projects that I've approved and my colleagues have approved um, at the council and they're just sitting on the pipeline for HPD to do the closing. You know, some of these projects we approved two years ago and HPD still has not closed on them. Is that gonna happen with these applications? That has not happened in ANCP. Um, the reason being we stalled way too long um, under the TIL development program and ANCP is sort of the rebirth of that. Um, we have demonstrated over the last few years that we get the approvals and, and we start closing. Okay, all right. Um, and then finally, marketing. You know, as I mentioned before, I want my communities to take advantage of this opportunity. This is a great opportunity. How is uh, how's marketing gonna happen locally uh, in my community? So I, I'll just reiterate a couple of the marketing requirements through HPD and then I'll let Samantha mention some of their additional activities. So um, an info session, two info sessions are actually required and they are lo they're held locally. So that is um, advertising them out to the media, uh, to the local media and letting folks know that they should show up, they should ask questions and that they should apply. Um, we also do a local periodical in addition to a citywide periodical and something called a hard to reach periodical. So that may be, um, you know, a community that's not really focused, uh, a, a demographic that's not really focused in that neighborhood, but maybe, you know, uh, a hard to reach group. Um, and then additionally, we, we work with partners. So we may reach out to your office. We may reach out to other not-for-profits in the area and advertise this opportunity so that they get it out to their networks. Um, and who, so um, when you apply, who's approving these applications? Is, is it the city? Is it Bronx Borough? Is it East, you know, who? Who's approving these applications? The way that marketing works is all applications are considered. They're all uh, sort of logged and obtain, obtained and logged um, and then randomized. Um, and then in the order of the randomization, um, Bronx Pro will, Bronx Pro or um, someone that they hire will start to look at those applicants to determine their eligibility. They will submit the eligible applicants to HPD and we will do, do a double check to make sure that they meet the criteria. And um, if, they, if they're eligible, found eligible, we will um, reach out to them to, to do a, a sort of a screening. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Adams. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, Councilor Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, congratulations, uh, Chair Salamanca, on this project. It sounds terrific. Um, but I have, uh, I'm just curious about the answer to the question you posed in your introductory remarks. What is the technical nature of the financing in this project that um, makes it so that 
uh, there is not a set aside for the community in, in which it's built. Yeah, so, so the agency uh, on the whole is not uh, able to provide a community preference for projects that are occupied. So in this particular project, I calculated we have about a 43% occupancy rate. Um, we have returning residents and that way we're not allowed to do uh, um, community preference. We do have the preference for mobility, uh, visual and hearing impairment, but not community preference. So in a way the 43% occupancy meets that requirement. Got exactly. it. And then secondly, um, why isn't the 15% set aside for homeless part of this project? Um, so this is a home ownership project um, and we don't, we don't typically institute the homeless set aside for the home ownership projects. All right, thank you very much. Congratulations again, council member. Thank you, council member Rosenthal. Council, are there any other council member questions at this time? Yes, there are, there are council member questions from council member Barron and council member Miller. Thank you, council member Barron. Uh, thank you, madam chair. So this is a home ownership project. Is it similar to the project that we just discussed where those residents that are there now as tenants will buy their units as a co-op? Mm -hmm. Correct. And is it the same cost, 2,500? Correct. And it, again, regardless of the size of the, well, what is the range of the size of the units in this development? Sure, we have uh, ones, twos, threes, and fours. One to four bedrooms. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Miller? program is this it, it what exactly what program is hpd using to facilitate this project uh this is conducted under the affordable neighborhood cooperative program or ancp are, are, are there any other programs or, or monies in conjunction with this um not from hpd this all till or tenant interim lease properties are, are renovated through ancp mm-hmm Okay, and uh, so on the other piece that, that uh, the other members had mentioned before about the community preference and, and uh, pre-existing occupancy, even at 43%, uh, generally we see uh, uh, community board preferences at around a minimum of 50%. Mm -hmm. So 43, 48, I, I think we're still what, what is, is selling it just a, a wee bit short. In, in doing so. And uh, for, for Council Member Salamanca, I, I think, and, and for all of us that are on, I've been witnessing, and I, I know that Council Member uh, Alika Samuels and, and Cornegy uh, just did an affordable housing piece in, in, uh, in, in their districts collectively, um, similar to this project here, uh, probably townhouses. And, and, um, and so, particularly for communities of color, um, uh, in, in the time of COVID-19, uh, but prior to and, and post, um, building wealth has been a, a significant concern. It is, it, it is, it is uh, said that in over the next uh, decade that people, uh, 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 African-American community uh, will have a zero net worth and, and, and Latino uh, right behind um, uh, because of savings or lack thereof. And that um, the, the greatest way to achieve that is through home ownership. And so I, I think the goal is to make home ownership uh, as, uh, as, as readily available uh, to, to the community anywhere as possible. Council Member uh, 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 Adams and I um, have, have uh, rehabbed uh, homes and, and I think nearly 400 homes in, in our district have, have, in our collective districts have been turned over over the past five years uh, to home ownership uh, with community board preferences as, as well. Um, but it's also, you know, it, it really has a, a significant 
a long-term impact in community uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, that addresses all these infrastructure disparities that, that we're seeing now. So um, I would love to, to, to know what, uh, what the city is doing to take those things into consideration. But I would also share with my colleagues um, that as marketing is, is, is really important, um, but we have done uh, significant local marketing, churches, synagogues, mosques, um, uh, and other organizations uh, that, that are prevalent in, in the community to make sure that people are engaged. Uh, more importantly, um, understanding rules of engagement, right? Because we could create these projects, these really great programs uh, for talk to available those are these opportunities, all the things that need to happen, all the preparation, all the taxes, all the credit scores, all the, you know, all those things that need to happen leading up to this. Even when we have set asides, they get picked off, right? And so they said, yeah, we, we, we took a thousand applications from the community, but 999 of them were, were disqualified. So what I have seen is that developers have actually uh, sponsored workshops along with members and community to prepare people for these uh, uh, ownership opportunities. Is something like that in the pipeline? Great, sorry, my baby was screaming so I didn't want the, the mic on. Um, <laughs> So uh, we do we do recommend to uh, potential applicants that they are um, pursuing first time home buyer education and through that there's a lot of resources up, uh, available including um, down payment assistance um, training associated with the value and also the re the responsibility associated with home ownership um, I don't I don't know that Bronx Pro carries out those um, those specific um, you know, opportunities or resources, but um, we do as an agency really aim to make sure that these purchasers are lined up and that they're ready to become home buyers. They're not just submitting an application that they're really, um, you know, preparing themselves for this opportunity. So uh, again, I, I would just submit that there are MOUs that really require developers to, to participate in such programs. To... Let's say okay. fund such programs. The developer is, is a local um, uh, CBO as well. Is, is that correct? Hi. So um, Bronx Pro and Avante are both. Uh, Bronx Pro is a local organization, but we're a for profit. But we are engaging um, the organization you have to work with in partnership with us to provide technical assistance to all the residents. Um, so once we close and start construction, they will begin a series of workshops with those residents to get them ready for home ownership. And, and then uh, the broader community with the potential availabilities that come open aside from those who are currently uh, occupying the um, residencies? So if I, if I understand. Will, will, that, will, will those services be extended to them as well? Um, yeah, we have discussed that with you, Hab, um, and we can revisit it. Um, but yeah, the idea is that once they come collectively as a, you know, a new co-op, you know, insiders and, and new purchasers, that there would be some interaction with you, Hab, to, you know, help that transition. Okay. It is, it is important that Indigenous folks t uh, take advantage of these opportunities. I have seen you know, if, if these provisions aren't put in place, the communities no longer represent folks that who, who have, have, have lived in, and oftentimes suffered in these communities uh, for decades. And, and when the communities on the come up, um, they don't have an opportunity to take advantage. And I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that we are developing as we, we like to use uh, uh, the phrase of, of one of our more south, uh, um, known Southeast Queens residents, FUBU, for us, by us. And when you have developers from the community, uh, we should have residents from the community. And, and, and so that these development should be a representative of, of, of indigenous folks as well. You know, and particularly as we articulated um, the direct correlation 
relation between home ownership and wealth. Yeah, and I would just also like to add that, um, you know, Bronx Pro will continue, our affiliate TPM will continue as the property manager and our property management team has a group of folks we call residential services that just works with residents to help them stabilize or get one shot deals or whatever. Um, so we will, they do have some home ownership technical expertise and they would be available to the residents here. And that's something that Bronx Pro provides to anybody that lives in our portfolio. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller. Thank you very much for the thoughtful questions and the thoughtful responses. I appreciate it. Uh, council, I'm not sure that there are any other council members still in the meeting, but we verify that. Are there any more council member questions? There are no more council member questions. Thank you very much. There being no more questions for this panel, you are excused and thank you very much for your testimony today. Council members of the public who wish to testify on LU 660, the Union Avenue cluster. There are no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 660, the Union Avenue cluster at this time, we will now move on to our next hearing. I now open the public hearings on LU 661 and a pre-considered LU for application number 202-05412HAM, both concerning the 266 West 96th Street project. LU 661 is an application submitted by HPD pursuant to section 197-C of the New York City Charter. The related application, pre-considered LU 202-05412HAM, was submitted pursuant to section 576-A of the New York State Private Housing Finance Law. Both request approval for the disposition city-owned property located at 266 West 96th Street in Manhattan. The disposition will facilitate the development of a 23-story mixed-use building containing residential and community facility uses in Council Member Helen Rosenthal's district in Manhattan. And I now recognize my colleague, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, for remarks. Great, thank you so much, Chair Adams, and congratulations for holding this historic hearing. Um, and I also wanna thank the New York City Council staff for really doing such a beautiful job managing all these Zoom meetings. I'm, I'm in awe of your work, hats off to you. Um, on this particular project, I look forward to hearing the testimony of HPD and the developer. Um, this particular site has had a very long history and I'm pleased that the city and the developer are working together to build um, on, on this particular site. Um, there has been movement um, since uh, the project was initially presented to the community board um, a few months ago and I'm really pleased about that movement because we've improved on the affordability of all the units by lowering all of the AMI levels. So units that had been designated at 130% AMI are down to 120%. Um, of course, they've adhered to uh, the New York City Council requirement that 15% of the units, units are for the homeless. Um, for those who are on fixed pension, disabilities who live on, people with disabilities who live on SSI. And that in particular will be really meaningful to members of my community for, home, for whom uh, there really are no other housing options. And I wanna thank Land Use Chair Salamanca for his leadership on the homeless set aside. Thank you so much for that incredibly powerful change um, to these to this affordable housing. Um, I want to thank HPD. They've created a new category for 67 people at 67% of AMI and also at 77% of AMI. And I really want to thank them for that. In particular, I want to thank the developer, Hal Fentner, um, 
for for all of his work on this project. I think he is dedicated to providing affordable housing and that's incredibly meaningful um, to me and to our community. I am hopeful and this is what I'll be listening for in the testimony, I'm hopeful that HPD can bring down the number of units in the 120% AMI category down to 27 to 67% range by the time of this vote. And, um, you know, my question specifically to HPD will be why they think they'll be able to rent out units at 120% of AMI where that just doesn't seem to be the demand um, with the people who we work with in our office. But I'm very appreciative of and very excited about this project. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. And also I wanna thank the city council land use staff, um, in particular, Andrew Lassiter for working so hard to make sense of this project and to help me understand um, what is being uh, offered by HPD and the developer. Couldn't have done it without them. Really wanna thank them for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for your remarks today. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel presenting LU661 and application number 2025412HAM for the 266 West 96th Street project is Vianda Simmons, Salah Mallory, Melissa Outen, and Nina Ritchie from HPD. Carol Rosenthal from Fried Frank, who will be presenting for the development team, and Hal Fentner and Mimi Rigorodetsky, who are available to answer questions on behalf of the developer. Okay. Council, please administer the affirmation. Uh, so, uh, Sarah Mallory uh, remains under oath. Could the panelists please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Your presentation is now being loaded into Zoom. When you request the next slide, a staff member will advance it. As always, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin. Actually, uh, does it make sense for HPD to go first in testimony? Uh, is that a question for us or for that council? For council. Jeff, does that make sense? Um, you can present in whatever order you feel. Okay. Great. We'll go ahead and do that then. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much. My name is Sarah Mallory uh, here on behalf of HPD. Land use item number 661 and pre-considered item number 20205412 HAM are related to the urban land use review process or ULIP application seeking disposition approval under section 197C and sale to a developer selected by HPD under section 576A2 of the private housing finance law for a city owned lot occupied, located at 266 West 96th Street, Block 1243, Lot 57 in Manhattan, Council District 6. The sponsor of the project, Fetner Properties, proposes to develop the disposition site under HPD's Mixed Middle Income Program, M2, along with the privately owned property at Block 1243, Lots 59 and 60. Under the program guidelines, sponsors purchase city-owned and or privately owned land and construct multifamily buildings in order to create rental housing units with a range of affordability. The disposition site currently contains a former MTA substation that will be demolished along with two privately owned buildings on the adjacent lots. The new building constructed in their place will be 23 stories and will contain 171 residential units, inclusive of a superintendent unit. There will be a mixture of unit types within the new building, including 80 micro units, 36 one bedroom, 47 two bedroom, and eight three bedroom apartments. 
of the total unit count, the proposal for 26 West 96, 266 West 96th Street includes 68 permanently affordable dwelling units that will be marketed to households with incomes ranging from 27% to 120% of AMI, including- Can I just interrupt for a second? I'm sorry. Was there a, a slide presentation that was, that was supposed to be going on? Because we don't see slides moving. I just want to clarify. No, not yet. That'll be coming right after this part. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Including 11 units, approximately 16% of the affordable units that will be set aside for formerly homeless households. The project is also participating in the voluntary inclusionary housing program. Of the permanently affordable units, it is anticipated that 35 will be micro units with rents ranging from $215 to $1,642. 14 will be from one bedroom units with rents ranging from 283 to $2,487, and 19 will be two-bedroom units with rent ranging from $425 to $2,977. The balance of the unit count will be market rate apartments. The building at 226, sorry, 226 West 96th Street will also include community facility space on the ground floor that will house the Salvation Army who will return to the space as well as amenities for the building's residents, such as the health club, lounge areas, clubhouse space, and outdoor open space for residents on the second floor. Amenities will be available free of charge for tenants of the permanently affordable units. In order to develop the project at 226 West 96th Street, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval for land use item number 661 and the accompanying pre-considered item 20205412 HAM. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I will turn it over to um, Carol. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, subcommittee members, Chair Salamonica, and Council Member Rosenthal. I'm Carol Rosenthal. I'm um, at Free Frank and Land Use Council to Fetner Properties, uh, who is the project sponsor. I wish to echo what people have said today, which is um, and extend my deepest appreciation to all of you for making the extra effort to conduct this hearing in these very challenged times and thereby also moving these critical projects along for the city. Um, I much admiration for, for all of you and, and the staff who's made this um, opportunity available to us. Uh, and I also want to, to thank council member Rosenthal, no relation, um, for all her wise um, counsel and, and, and work uh, on this project with us. So I'm gonna start now with slide one and go through and tell you a little bit more about the project. The um, site is well suited for new residential uses. It's on West 96th Street, uh, a, a wide street. Um, it is close to Riverside Park. It is very close to transportation, including uh, the express uh, line as well as the local lines, uh, buses along West 96th and buses along Broadway. Next slide. The site, um, the development site includes two privately owned sites. These are sites that Fetner Properties has under contract, as well as the disposition site, which is the site owned by the city and is the former IRT electrical substation. Uh, next slide. The disposition site, uh, as you can tell in this in photograph, um, is um, not in great shape. It has been uh, unused, oh, it's been owned by the city, but it's been unused and vacant for over a quarter of a century. Uh, there's been a number of prior attempts to try and use it, um, but it has not, not been successful to date. Um, it is, um, uh, a site that we are hoping to convert into something amazing. And so if we can get to the next slide. So the proposal is for, uh, as Sarah noted, 171 residential units. Um, it's the building uh, is, uh, it's in a high density district and it complies with all of the 
existing zoning requirements. So there's no request for any zoning waivers. It's in a, a, 12, a, a 10 FAR, a 10 FAR district that can go to 12. If the, the building would be three, 235 feet high, um, across the street is some, a building that is 35 stories. So it's, it's well in the, in the mix here. Um, and um, it will have 68 units permanently affordable. And I know the, um, this is something that the de developer has been proud to work with HPD to provide uh, from the beginning, the permanent affordability. 32 of those units would be in the uh, inclusionary housing program required to be permanent and the rest are uh, something in addition to be permanently affordable. The project is also um, uh, has ground floor space. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to some of the um, floor plates. Um, and the only other, the, the other thing I wanted to know here, and then we'll move into the other slide, is that it's been developed as a real um, building that fits into the neighborhood in the sense of both its, it, its material. So it's not a glass building, it's not a glass box, it's brick and stone, and um, we think will be a lovely addition to the neighborhood. Next, next slide. So the, um, the what is there now, this uh, IRT substation has some existing um, context um, and historic value. And what, we, what the developer has done is taken that ground floor of the building and moved it, um, the pattern um, to cover the entire building with the arches on the ground floor and taken some of the um, architectural elements. These, I guess they're called cartouches, these like flourishy little things on the, on the, the windows and retain them and put them back in the building. Um, which we think will be a, another beautiful um, element to make, you know, to make this part of part of the neighborhood. Um, this is in, I, I will say it's in very big contrast to what's there now. Um, uh, up until six weeks ago, I spent every weekday getting on the subway at the 96th Street stop. And um, with, now when you see the building right now, it's got the tree growing out and it's stitched on the side. So um, trying to be held together. So this is something we think will be a vast improvement for the community and for the building, for the location. Um, next slide, just to talk a little bit about specifics about what's going uh, proposed for going in the building. Um, this is the ground floor. So you have the residential lobby and then you have two community facility units, one of which will be for the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army owns one of those buildings right now, and they will be able to return to the site uh, and own their own unit when this is, when the project is complete. Next slide. This is the cellar program, and uh, it has the, also some space to Salvation Army. There is a health club, which will be for the residents of the building. And then of course, the back of house and, and mechanical space. Next slide. This is the second floor. Uh, it has the superintendent's unit as well as very generous uh, tenant amenity space. The dark blue is blue is what's inside. And then the, uh, the crosshash is a um, uh, open terrace, outdoor terrace, which will be enjoyed by all of the residents in the building. Next slide, please. So we've been, um, uh, Hal Butner has been working with the community for a long time um, with this project and with HPD. Um, we try to be very good partners and, and very um, responsive. So in addition to the permanent affordability, um, we, Hal has committed that there will be no uh, amenity fee for any of the residents of the affordable housing. They'll have free use of all of the, um, the spaces that you saw that will be for the tenants. There will be the same finishes for the market rate and affordable units. If one um, unit has uh, granite tops, the other will have granite. And this is something that um, is, uh, Hal's very, um, does in all of his buildings and is very committed to doing, to making the, the units be um, the same. Um, as noted, this will include a number of um, micro units. We also sometimes call them compact units. And one of the issues at the community board was, well, maybe some people won't want uh, built-in furniture. Um, and so there'll be some options so people can have the built-in furniture, which we think makes the units um, very attractive. And, and if, but if people who have their own don't have to. So that's, it was another, another aspect of this. 
Um, we were asked by the community board to consider becoming a maintenance partner for DOT, a DOT sidewalk extension at West 96th Street, and there are ongoing discussions with DOT for that. And finally, last, certainly not least, is um, the community board has asked us to participate in a local construction advisory committee uh, to address the construction challenges at the site. And that is something that we, we welcome. And um, we know that the community board has a robust um, and very solid uh, program for that. And we are looking forward to, to that kind of um, cooperation. So next slide. So this is the, um, I mean, this is a discussion of the AMIs and the percentage of units. So our original proposal, this is what we went to the community board with, and this is what was um, at the city planning commission. Um, for the 68 units, we had uh, 10 units at 50% AMI, 29 at 70% and 29 at 130%. Um, we were asked to lower as best we could um, the 130% uh, AMI units. Also, thanks to the very um, good work of city council, uh, we now have a set aside for uh, homeless, formerly, hopefully formerly homeless uh, occupants. And so the new um, mix is, includes that set aside. So currently um, what we are, are proposing um, is the 11 units will be for homeless, formerly homeless. There will be seven units at 67, 15 at 77%, and 35 at 120%. So um, this is something that we've worked hard. It's a very challenging project um, economically. Uh, and so this is something that we're happy to be able to do at this juncture. Um, and we understand there'll be some continued just conversations about that, which we, we welcome as well. So the next slide. Um, two last points. One is that this project has um, undergone a full review, environmental review, uh, and a full environmental impact statement that was prepared. Um, and there was one area where there was a potential for significant adverse impact. That was um, because the building uh, is a historic resource and eligible for New York City and state um, register and eligible for um, city landmark. It was um, an impact to demolish it to build a new building. Um, it is not a New York City landmark. It's not calendared as a landmark, but it has attributes that make it um, eligible. So um, in addition to the work that we've already talked about in terms of preserving the facade, um, as mitigation, we, were gonna, we will be preparing a historic American Building Survey, which is an archival uh, review of the project for um, keeping for future generations. And finally, next um, slide. Another, another challenge is, as you can imagine, with the former IRT electrical substation, there's great concern about environmental conditions at the site. Um, this project was accepted into the New York State Brownfield Cleanup Program in August 2019. Um, we, uh, so far, we have found some contamination, not nearly as much as we feared. Um, and in any event, because we're gonna be under the oversight of this program, both the state Department of Environmental Conservation and the State Department of Health will be reviewing the remediation, the investigations, and the like for uh, work at this site. That concludes the formal part of our presentation. And we are clearly, we're available for questions. I'm available, Hal's available, and I know HPD is, is available as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosenthal, uh, for the presentation. Um, before I go on to uh, council member questions, I, I just had a quick question. I, I'm a former chair for a community board, so I thought it was very interesting that you enlisted uh, the name of community board seven several times in your presentation. Um, I, I find that really, um, really interesting, and it's always a good thing to bring the community boards in as partners, and the fact that you're looking at for uh, um, perhaps doing a DOT, um, community partnership with the community board, I find that very impressive. Was there a relationship with your organization prior to this project with community board seven? Uh, no, not, no, not really. But we, um, you know, we uh, feel strongly about working with the community boards. I feel strongly about working with them. Uh, full disclosure, I'm in community board seven. So that's okay. another, um, 
you know, another perhaps a connection. But you know, generally, Hal has uh, Hal Fetner has feels strongly about working with the community boards, and we're uh, proud that we can make that part of what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very important. Also, okay. And thank you again for your presentation. I now invite my colleagues to ask questions. If you have questions for the panel, please click on the raise hand button on the participant panel. Council, are there any council member questions at this time? Council member Rosenthal has questions, followed by council member Barron. Council member thank Rosenthal. You. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing council member Barron's questions, actually. But um, I never heard an answer to my question to HPD about um, what their, what's been their um, history in marketing units at 120% for this area. Um, what's their success rate been? What's been their experience? How long does it take to rent at that amount? Thank you, Councilmember, for that question. I don't have the specifics of that in front of me today, but I will say that market rate on the Upper West Side is usually higher than 120% AMI. Um, so we can get back to you with some specifics on uh, projects in the districts. Uh, okay, I mean, yes, that is true. That is true, that market rate is higher. Um, and so maybe there'll be interest for that reason, um, we have not, people walking in our door are not looking for units at 120% AMI. The people walking in our door who really need help would fall between the 27 and 67% AMI. That's who we see. Um, now, of course, everyone from around the city will be applying, um, but I, I would love to learn more about, um, yeah, I can't even, first of all, I can't think of another project in this exact area at 120%, but um, the ones down by 60th Street, there could be some down there. Um, so maybe we can look at that. I think the building TF Cornerstone built um, was at higher AMI levels and for the affordable and I'd love to see what's been the experience there um, for renting out at those higher AMI levels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And my questions are similar to my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal's questions in terms of the units that are being supported in this project with city money that include what you're proposing to be um, 138%. No, you're proposing 103 of those units at market and you're calling uh, those that you're offering at 120% of the AMI. You're also designating them as the city does as affordable uh, and you have to remember that this range of affordability includes those other areas, Yonkers and Westchester, that pull up what is in fact not the city's AMI. So I'm concerned at the fact that you're uh, proposing 35 units at that 120% of the AMI. So for me, looking at the units at 27, 67, and 77% of the AMI, that's 33 units out of the total of 171. So that's problematic. And I also wanted to ask, what is the size of what you're calling a micro unit? So I can, I can respond to that. The, the micro units uh, will range in size from 266 to 378 uh, square feet. Um, and just to give some context for that, the um, HPD's design guidelines usually target 350 to 400 square feet for 
senior studios and 300 square feet for supportive housing units. So they will be um, they will be smaller. That's part of the reason we are very focused on the uh, amenity space in the building. Um, but we think they're going to be a great um, um, option for people in terms of a different housing, another kind of housing unit. I think that uh, 266 square feet is very small. And yes, it's uh, lower than what the city is talking about, which is normally 300, as you have said, or 350, but it's very small. And of course, uh, some people would of course say, be, great, be very grateful. But in this time of this pandemic, and we're talking about density and talking about people being crammed together in small quarters, it certainly speaks to, I think, a lack of adequate space for someone who is in that category. And I do want to say that I do appreciate uh, that this does have 15%, which has been pushed by council under the leadership of Sa uh, council member Salamanca. And that is uh, commendable. We could even look to see how we can move that up. But half of these so-called affordable units are at 120%. And that to me is problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Council, are there any other Council Member questions? If there are any other Council Member questions, Council Members, please raise their hands. I'm the only one left. Everybody else left. <laughs> there are no more Council Member questions. Thank you very much. There being no more questions. For this panel, the panel is now excused. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. At this time, I invite Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer to bring remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. I really appreciate Council Member Rosenthal, and I am Gail Brewer, and I am the Manhattan Borough President. Um, I know this site very well, and um, I've always long believed that when the land is city owned, uh, it should be redeveloped into housing that's 100% affordable. And in March 1990, when the city first proposed to dispose of the site, uh, Manhattan Community Board 7 noted that the site was an invaluable resource, not only as an opportunity to raise capital, but as a location for very, very needed services. And the board noted the lack of sites on the Upper West Side that could be repurposed for public use. And that's an ongoing issue. Um, 30 years later, it's still true. And we all know that we're in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. I don't need to tell you. And we need more affordable housing. In 1990, the city was trying to raise money through the sale of its properties, including this one. Obviously, everything has changed today. And we're trying to figure out what to do. But I do want to mention that this parcel the one that I'm talking about in terms of the um, MTA site, the city owned site makes up 48% of the project site. Yet the applicant initially proposed to make only 40% of the residential units affordable. And I know these numbers are shifting. I know there'll be more negotiations, but just like council member Rosenthal, I urge HPD to get as much as they can out of this site. It's not just a number of square units, but the percentage of residential floor area that will be affordable. Because we all know, and we heard earlier about these compact units that the developer is proposing, that initial proposal, the initial proposal was to dedicate only 36% of the residential square footage as affordable. We obviously cannot do that. These compact units, they are small. And in the middle of this particular challenging housing situation, I think, I thought they were going to be as small as 290 square feet, and I just heard 266. I think that's a challenge. We all know that in this pandemic, God help us if we have another one, even the public spaces are not available to any resident. Be clear, be clear on that. Everybody who's in a building like this cannot use their public space. We all know about the 120% AMI. We just heard that. And just so you know, I also hope it goes down, way down, because that's a $95,000 income. And we don't need housing for that. 
Um, housing New York, as you know, plans to utilize city owned properties to produce affordable housing. And when we allow a city owned property to comprise half of a site, but settle for a development in which less than half of the units and way less than half of the residential square footage is affordable, we're not meeting that goal in my opinion. This project is slated to receive a number of benefits. We know about the ones that they're receiving, uh, tax benefits included. And um, the developer, I believe, was able to purchase the city owned site for a nominal amount. Uh, he is expected to receive an HPD subsidy, a property tax abatement, and tax credits to the Brownfield Cleanup Program. So to be more specific, this is what I suggest. We need more affordable units. A minimum of 65% of the units should be affordable based on the percentages that I just gave you. At least half of the units should be for households earning up to 60%, no more. And I heard the council member mention the 27 to 67% AMI within that range. And compact units should comprise no more than 15% of the total numbers of units in that project. So I know that it's a tough time. I also want to mention that on the Upper West Side, when we move uh, funding from uh, the Collegiate School, it's a development that is on West End Avenue, the school moved to Riverside Center, and there was a switcheroo with the developer. And to make a long story short, there's about $14 million in HPD's coffers for housing to be affordable on the Upper West Side. And I know HPD is working with one developer that is in fact um, doing a uh, affordable 100% unit, and I appreciate that, but why couldn't some of that unit's money be used here for these units. Now, I'm particularly interested in this proposal and I didn't vote uh, for it when I gave my ULIP presentation because I was the one when I was in the city council who convinced the MTA to sell the property to the city for $1. And I've always advocated since that it be 100% affordable. We know there's a brownfield cost. We also know at that time we couldn't get the Salvation Army, which you know has a store, very popular store on the site, to cooperate with a nonprofit developer at the time. The Mid-Manhattan NAACP has always cooperated and I know they've moved off the site, but they always supported the nonprofit. So today we have an application that I think needs to be changed to include many more affordable units at a lower AMI and a square footage in the apartments that people want to live in permanently because even the market rates of small units, a small unit for anybody, and I don't think it should be so small. So I appreciate your careful review of this application. I thank you for your time on this matter, but I do think there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Borough President. Always great to see you and hear you. Thank you. Okay. Council, are there any members of the public wishing to testify on LU 661 and the related matter? Council Member Miller appears to have a question. Okay. Council Member Miller? Council Member Miller, make sure you're unmuted. doing. I know she's been working on this project for a really long time and it is important to her district, to her community, but it's also important to the entire city that we kind of set a template for how we uh, manage affordability uh, beyond uh, uh, the mandatory housing inclusion, which is questionable. Um, and, and I just have one question, and this is for HPD, not for, for the developer. The 15% the, the, the uh, the mandatory 15% uh, that uh, uh, we are now working on the, um, for, for, for the homeless, does that, is that exclusive to um, the formerly homeless, uh, registered homeless, or is there a, uh, is it available to those earning, those low earning folks on a fixed income who generally don't qualify for affordable housing? I think we all um, 
get those letters from uh, people who are uh, receiving government benefits, uh, receiving government benefits as well as on uh, uh, fixed pensions and so forth, but don't meet even the minimal threshold. Um, do they qualify for, for the 15% set aside? Um, thank you, Councilmember, for that question. This 15% uh, set aside is for formerly homeless individuals who do come through the city shelter system. Uh, and this is set up through council legislation um, and part of how we work through this process. Yeah, uh, to my colleagues, I, I think that um, I, I applaud the work, but there are people who are doubled and tripled up and living on couches and so forth for years that keep, uh, I get it all the time. And I know my colleagues do as well, talking to people throughout the city that they, they are on connect all the time and they are uh, constantly being rejected because they are minimum earners. And, and yet, you know, for, for they are, bouncing from, from friend to friend and from family member to family member. And because they're not in the shelter system, they have no way of accessing this affordability. So I think that's something that uh, we should take a look at um, in, in the council, but uh, I thank you all for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Miller. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go back to you, Council. Are there any members of the public I on this application? Okay, Jeff, I need you to repeat. There are witnesses, but first you can excuse the applicant girl, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Once again, panel, you are excused. public signed up to testify on this item. The first one is Robert Bornstein. Start speaking. Robert, your clock will start now. Yeah, hi, Robert Bornstein. I am opposed uh, to um, this uh, application on the grounds that it's violative of the city charter, chapter 15, section 384, insofar as there is no mayoral approval and that there is no sealed competitive bidding and there is no um, uh, sale for the value of the property. It disturbs me no end that uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Brewer uh, uh, has said now and I'm trying to quote her because I just wrote it down, that the developer was able to purchase the site at a nominal amount. The purpose of this meeting is whether it should be sold at all. It's my contention that sale of the property to the developer in violation of section, uh, chapter 15, section 384 would amount to a fraudulent transfer of the property and moreover, this is a mention of any compliance with Section 384 was entirely absent from any presentation um, by Fetner, its attorneys, or the uh, HPD people in this proceeding or in any other prior proceedings before any other uh, uh, um, boards or, or hearings of the city. In this respect, um, there was a hearing before the City Planning Commission that uh, commenced on January 22nd, 2020. And at that hearing, they made materials that I submitted as an exhibit to their hearing. I am unable technologically at age 75 and with my Time limited expired. technological abilities to send those materials to you. So I ask that you reach out to the uh, City Planning Commission and, uh, and acquire those materials and review them as an exhibit. One is a letter to the Planning Commission dated January 27th. One is a letter to uh, the mayor and, and also uh, sent to, to Corey Johnson and the Planning Commission dated uh, December 12th, 
2019, and it includes handwritten submissions by me at Thank meeting uh, at, on, on February 5th, 2020, of Mr. the Planning Bornstein, Commission. Your time has expired. Yes. We thank you very thank much you. for your testimony. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Council, are there any more witnesses, uh, public witnesses? The next witness is Mark Diller, who is also testifying on LU 661. Clock will start now. Mr. Diller, you have two minutes. You may begin. Please unmute Mr. Diller. I thought I did, I'll try again. How's that? Yeah, that's very fine. good. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Chair Adams and council members, especially my hometown council member, uh, Rosenthal, appreciate this opportunity to present on behalf of Community Board 7, who resolved to approve this um, application by a vote of 36 to zero with three abstentions and one recusal. Uh, the major reasons why we offer our approval for this are the combination of cleaning up of a long dormant toxic site with the uh, addition of affordable housing. This is literally a brown field. I have been in the backyard of Mr. Bornstein's building and seen an underground stream that emanates down that very sharp hill that you saw in the illustrations um, and it trickles into the backyards and then goes underground again. It is truly a toxic site that requires cleanup and we are encouraged that the developer is pursuing the New York State program which will require third party verification of the um, of, of the actual efficacy of the cleanup. Uh, with respect to, uh, it is an approval uh, on our board's part with respect with, with conditions and recommendations. Uh, the recommendations have to do with outreach to uh, seniors uh, in a marketing way, not dissimilar to what uh, Council Member Salamanca was recommending in his district in an earlier application today. Um, we uh, uh, are, and, and the street on which this is located is one of the most dangerous in our district. And so uh, it is essential that we have uh, the construction coordinating committee through the community board. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the recommendations were that 75% of the affordable units be below 100% AMI. And I believe that the testimony and the questions from the council members today reinforced the need for truly affordable, affordable housing. At present, we are at 50% of the affordable units. I understand that this is an equation that needs to be balanced, but perhaps the collegiate money or some other way of tinkering with that equation can get us to um. the required amount. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for uh, the, uh, for this chance to add affordable housing to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Diller. Council, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify? Council Rosenthal, do you have any questions? Any other council members? Council member questions? If you are a council member who has questions, please press the raise hand button in the panelist view. There are no council member questions. Okay, the witness is excused. Thank you. Council, I'll ask one more time if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 661 and the pre-considered LU for application number 20205412HAM, both concerning the 266 West 96th Street project. There are three witnesses from the public. The next one is Richard Lorio. And I see that Council Member Rosenthal has raised her hand. Richard, your clock will start now. Okay. You have uh, two minutes. Yeah, how you doing? Just give me one minute. I was making sure everybody can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, panel. My name is Richard Iorio. I have been a member for SEIU 32 BJ for over 10 years. I'm an essential residential worker, uh, and I'm speaking on today behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 266 West 96th Street. 
a 32 VJ supports responsible development that creates good property service jobs and that they pay the prevailing wage. We're happy to report that Fetner Properties has made a credible commitment to these jobs created by this project that will be good jobs at the paying the prevailing wage. Additionally, throughout this crisis, Fetner has acted as a responsible employer and continues to put the needs of their essential workers first. The jobs created by this development will give workers from diverse backgrounds the access to upward mobility and security. We need jobs like this more than ever. In addition, we strongly support the much needed permanently affordable housing this project brings to the Upper West Side. This housing that workers like me stand to benefit greatly from. On behalf of more than 6,032 BJ members that live and work in Community District 7 and our larger New York City membership, we respectfully urge you to approve the project. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with apologies, uh, I actually just wanted to thank um, Chair Mark Diller from Community Board 7 for his time and for his coming to testify today. Um, you know, his dedication and the dedication of the Community Board and thinking through um, the details of the project are, are incredibly helpful. Um, so I really just wanted to be on the record thanking him today. Thank you, Chair Adams. You're amazing to watch in action. <laughs> Thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Council, please call the next witness. The next witness if on LU661 is Sarah Lind. Ms. Lynn? Can you hear me? I can hear you. You have two minutes. Clock right. starts now. Go ahead, Ms. Lynn. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to everyone and your commitment to affordable housing. Um, I'm here, I'm a co-secretary of Community Board 7. I'm here to speak in support of the project. Um, last summer, my 80-year-old mother-in-law was facing homelessness. She was on the verge of moving into a shelter because she couldn't find anywhere affordable to live. Uh, obviously, that was unacceptable to us, so she moved in with us, which is lucky. Um, but so many seniors in our city and our community are on the edge of homelessness and don't have any support system. Um, so I know that some people have questioned the micro units, but I believe they're exactly the kind of thing we need more of. I guarantee you that my mother-in-law would rather have her own micro unit than be sleeping on the bottom bunk of my six-year-old son's bed or God forbid, in a shelter. New York is facing an affordable housing crisis and it's critical that we build more housing and more affordable housing. I continue to call on the developers to lower the AMI for the affordable units, especially the micro units. Um, the people in our community who most need these micro units need them at deep affordability. Frankly, my mother-in-law would not be able to afford a unit at 60% of AMI. And I would also note, um, which was raised by Councilmember Miller earlier, that she would also not qualify for the homeless set-aside units because she's never actually been homeless, never gone through the shelter system, but she has been housing insecure for years. So that's something I do hope that the council will take up. Um, I wanted to note uh, the other, the question of density and COVID was raised earlier. And I know that the governor has been continually saying that density is the problem, but we know from places like Seoul, South Korea and Singapore, which are incredibly dense places with very few cases, that density is not the problem. Uh, in fact, overcrowding and unequal access to healthcare and lack of early and effective government action is the problem. In New York City, we know that the places with the most coronavirus cases are at are actually not those that are most dense, but those with the most overcrowding. Um, so to the extent that overcrowding contributes to poor health outcomes, projects like this one that help people get into their own housing will um, alleviate overcrowding and make New York City more resilient in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Council, are there any more members of the public wishing to testify at this time? Council Member Rosenthal has a question. Council Member Rosenthal. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, I, it's it's like 
a great day for me to see my community board seven colleagues. Um, so I, <laughs> I really just want to thank you, Sarah, for taking the time to testify and bringing up the example of your mother-in-law, which exactly speaks to Councilmember Miller's point. Um, I was going to ask you if she would have been able to afford um, a micro unit at any one of the levels. So uh, I think that's an incredibly important point and an incredibly um, big uh, um, failing on the part of HPD not to recognize all the people who are in that situation. Um, you know, when we talk about affordable senior housing, we say it takes seven years for someone, a senior to find affordable housing, but boy, we're not even including your mother-in-law when we think of those numbers. So I really appreciate your time and your, um, your bringing that story forward. It's very important for this conversation and, um, I thank you and I'm grateful for you as, as always. Thank, thank you, Sarah. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Councilmember Barron also has a question. Yes, Councilmember Barron. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It's not a question, it's just a comment as we're wrapping up. And I just wanted to commend you. You did a great job keeping these things moving. It's technical, it's first time, and you did a great job. And I also wanna send mm -hmm. great kudos to all the technical people that we don't see, but who are making this run so smooth. Yes. Thank you, Jeff, good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Barron for that. Appreciate it. Council? The next witness on LU661 is Sheldon Fine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mr. Fine? Mr. Fine, are you there? Can't unmute. Yes, I, can you hear me now? We yes. can hear you now. Thank you. The clock starts now. Two minutes. Okay, as president of the Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, which has 28 buildings in, on the West Side, West Harlem, and, and the South Bronx, dedicated to low-income, largely seniors, but low-income housing for people, supportive housing for people in need, I'm acutely aware of the need for affordable housing. And in this situation, we have an opportunity there are six developments between 91st Street and 96th Street that are either planned or, in op uh, or being built. And this is the only one that has any uh, possible affordable housing as a part of the plan. Uh, the fact that 40% uh, are affordable, certainly we could do better with the AMI situation, but it's significant. We have people, we have 5,000 people on three of our waiting lists and they were cut off people who would fit into a lot of this affordable, these affordable ranges. Um, this developer has been very uh, commu uh, communicating well by the community and accessible for questions and suggestions and responsive. And that's reassuring for the future. Um, what we love is this area is accessible by transportation, okay, including elevator um, to the subway. Uh, amongst the other situations that we find positive are that the uh, amenities are available to all residents, not just the market rate residents. And that the, uh, we're preservationists, that the uh, facade of the MTA substation is being preserved and extended. So it's attractive for our community. Most important uh, with the Brownfield uh, uh, cleanup pr program, we're assured of that. And we worried not only about the buildings there, but the school on 96 and Broadway. Overall, um, the need is great. Let's not, uh, let's be reasonable 
in uh, seeing what can be done by the developer HPD and the city to bring more affordability, but let's not throw away the one opportunity that's available in that area because of not having everything we want. Thank you, Mr. Fine, your time is up. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. Councilmember Rosenthal. <laughs> no, it's just the usual thank you to the community board seven members. Wow, three, three today, that's uh, my good fortune. Shelly, thank you for your help and for your testimony. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Council. Um, there are no more members of the public signed up to testify for this item. Okay. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 659, 660, 661, and pre-considered application number 20205412HAM, the public hearings on these items are now closed, and that concludes today's business. All items on today's agenda are hereby laid over. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc. Gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. And now I'd like to do my thank yous. I thank you to all of my colleagues who are here today, especially those who had items before this committee. I'd like to thank my colleagues again for being so thoughtful and taking your time out to be here at this hearing today. Subcommittee Council, you're outstanding. Thank you so much for being my right hand and my left hand and my texting buddy to keep me on track. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you to all of our amazing land use staff. We couldn't do this without you, without your guidance. You make us really, really look good in these Zoom hearings. Thank you so much. Sergeant at Arms, thank you for participating in today's hearing and all of your hard work behind the scenes. Everybody else who's behind the scenes, everybody that testified today, we do really thank you very much for being a part of this historic landmarks Zoom hearing. And with that, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Just a reminder, the live stream is still on. Thank you.